Hello and welcome to Airing Pain, the programme brought to you by Pain Concern, a UK charity that provides information and support for those of us living with pain. This programme was supported by a grant from Pfizer. Up till now, a lot of people have said, oh, well, nobody will die of pain. You know, let's not be worried about it. But you are one and a half times more likely to die if you've got pain. And you're twice as likely to die from cardiovascular or respiratory disease if you've got chronic pain. British GPs are probably the best primary care system in the world. I'm very proud of what we've created. You know, we are fantastic at trying to pick up chronic diseases before they develop or to stop them developing further. But we're not doing that with chronic pain, which actually is the biggest part of the problem. This April, the British Pain Society launched a new special interest group, which hopefully will be a milestone in the management of our chronic pain conditions. I'm Paul Evans, and for this edition of Airing Pain, I went along to the event. I started by speaking to Professor Richard Langford. He's an anaesthetist and pain medicine doctor at Bart's Hospital in London. He's also president of the British Pain Society. Well, today is actually a, a very important day for the British Pain Society. It is the launch of our primary and community care special interest group, um, or some people quite like to call them uh, special expertise groups, but special interest groups. And this is uh, one of 11 special interest groups in the British Pain Society. At this particular moment in time, when we have two things happening on a national level, one is the opportunity to collaborate with the Royal College of General Practitioners over their decision to have a clinical priority programme in chronic pain for the next three years, starting from April of this year for three years, plus a further two years of activity after that together with all that's happening in the wider NHS, particularly in England, with uh, GP consortia and commissioning. Uh, so whatever shape that should take, we're going to see our um, primary care colleagues maintaining and, if anything, becoming more influential in the management of the health service and the direction of care for patients. It couldn't be a better moment to be developing our general practice links and um, our general practice membership of the society. Professor Richard Langford, President of the British Pain Society. Now, Dr Martin Johnson is a GP based in Yorkshire. He's a long-standing interest in chronic pain and he's at the forefront of medical politics and particularly the successful campaign for pain to be made a clinical priority. Just recently, he was appointed Royal College of General Practitioners UK Clinical Champion for Pain Management. So, with 7.8 million of us living with chronic pain, why is it only now that our pain has been granted official status? The unfortunate thing is, even though we know that pain is one of the biggest clinical challenges and there's, there's so much data looking at the fact that pain is probably the long, biggest long-term condition we've actually got, it's not recognised as a condition, apart from, well, it is actually in Wales and in Scotland, but that doesn't make everything, because we need to have prioritisation around it within the medical communities. There's always been these, for example, assumptions that people don't die with pain, but we know from the research, from the excellent research from Scotland, that people do die quicker when they've got chronic pain. So I think what we're trying to do is raise it up the, the level. We're trying to educate people, particularly within primary care and community care, because it's not just doctors with pain that's so important. We're trying to educate them about the nature of chronic pain, that chronic pain is not just repeated acute pain, that actually there are changes that happen within our, within our body, and trying therefore to link this into the, the GP consultation, to get systems running. In fact, literally, it was only yesterday that we actually got to prove what we're going to do in the, in the first year. So, So what's that? One of the key things is because of some of the other priorities or some of the other initiatives that are happening within the pain world, we're trying to link them particularly into the development of the five pathways for the Map of Medicine project, which has been um, always happening under the auspices of the British Pain Society. One is on visceral pain, which is going to be pelvic and pain of both male and female. Just explain what visceral pain means. Visceral pain means pain with your organs but the commonest pain within that is pelvic pain. And in fact, those that deal with that constantly will actually say the figures for pelvic pain is that it's actually just as prevalent as low back pain, though probably not within actual people attending GP practices. 
We're going to look at spinal pain, so that's going to be of all descriptions, including neck pain. We're going to look at musculoskeletal pain when it's not caused by inflammation, which is the rheumatology aspect. They, they'll deal with that. We're going to look at um, neuropathic pain, so nerve ending pain. And we're also going to look at quite a unique pathway, uh, which is going to be a pain assessment, particularly aimed at, at GPs, but really pain assessment at any point of contact. Dr. Martin Johnson, the Royal College of General Practitioners, newly appointed clinical champion for pain management. Now, Dr. Mark Porter is a household name as a journalist and a broadcaster. He's chairing this launch of the British Pain Society's Special Interest Group for Primary and Community Care. He's also a GP and has a long-standing interest in pain management, having worked as an anaesthetist and in a pain management clinic back in the 80s. Secondary care, hospital management of pain is, is very good, but I still think there's a lot we could be doing in primary care, the community, general practice, call it what you will. For two reasons. I mean, I think there's a big problem with people self-medicating. I don't think Joe Public has much understanding of how painkillers are working or the best way to take them or what they should be taking them for or what, what mix they should be taking. What do you mean by self-medicating? Well, I mean, treating themselves over the counter. I mean, you buy um, aspirin, ibuprofen, paracetamol, codeine type drugs. I mean, we spend a fortune on, on, on these products and people use them often long term without really understanding what they should be doing without seeking expert help. When they do seek expert help in the community, um, GPs have varying degrees of expertise. You know, we could be doing a lot better at, at making sure. I mean, for instance, we don't even have any national guidance on how to tackle pain. Um, so it's great if you're a hospital consultant, you're a specialist, or you're an ex-anesthetist. But if you're a GP, it's one of a thousand things you have to know, and you may not be as good at it as you think. But as a GP, you are the first point of call, at least the first point of call for help with somebody in pain? Yeah, we're the first port of call after self-medication. So often it's not unusual for me to see people who've taken medication for headaches for nine months before they come and see me. I mean, there are others who come after nine minutes, but, you know, nine months they come. And actually, some find it very bizarre. About half a million people in the UK have a form of headache that we think is caused by them taking painkillers. So they start off with something, they take painkillers for it, and it ends up giving them a headache for which they take more painkillers, which are creating more of a problem. And all we do is simply stop the pills, and they magically get better, and they find that remarkable. But that's an example of when you have knowledge and you use it properly, you can get the best out of pain relief. But for sure, for people with arthritis and lots of other conditions, we are the first port of call, and generally we manage it very well. But for more complex, long-term conditions, managing somebody's pain effectively to making sure they don't have side effects isn't always a matter of simply getting the right medicine. It's also about state of mind. And we know that the psychology of the patient, the doctor-patient relationship, all of those sorts of things, explaining to patients what's going on, plays a, makes a massive difference to whether they're going to be someone who's going to be disabled by pain or be able to live with it. You, as a journalist and a frontline broadcaster with access to six million people, are you aware, as a mouthpiece, that people look at pain correctly? Well, I, I think it's a complex subject, and the problem is there's no such thing as, a, as an average patient, you know, an average person in a, with an average amount of pain. Each person is different. Our response to pain is very similar, no matter what the cause, actually. But what I think I want to do is address some of the myths and, and prejudices that surround pain, and that's probably the most useful thing we can do. I mean, I, I'd love to say we can educate the public and teach them about pain and all that, make a massive difference that way. But actually, probably what we can do is cherry pick a few items. For instance, the use of opiate morphine type painkillers. There's this general perception that these are addictive drugs, that you, know, you end up being a junkie if you start them, that they're given to people who are at the end of their life, all of those sorts of things. And that, for a while, held back the proper use of those drugs in cancer patients. And, and they're missed, those, you know, used appropriately. These are not generally addictive drugs. And they're very effective and people can carry, I've got patients who carry on working on them, you know, perfectly normal jobs. A lot of pain patients come away from a GP thinking they've been sent for cognitive behavioural therapy, whatever. It is in the mind. Look, I think one of the things that people need to get to grips with, both health professionals and the general public, is that pain is largely in the mind. The stimulus, whether it be a stubbed toe or an arthritic joint or a cancer in a bone or whatever, is very real. But the pathways that are taking that nasty signal go into the brain and it's the perception there that matters. And to try and just identify pain as purely 
a problem with a joint, so if I get rid of that joint problem, I'll be fine. It's simply not true. We know that's not the case. That in around, or at least a fifth of people with long-term pain, that signal going into the brain permanently changes the perception of that pain, and it can blow it out of all proportion. So it becomes an all-consuming thing. In the same way that, you know, if I was to stub on your toe at the same time as it was announced that you'd won the lottery, you probably wouldn't notice the pain coming from your toe. I'd be fine with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Until afterwards. And we often, we've all heard these situations, you know, where you're playing rugby and you get out of the scrum and there's a huge gash in your leg and you never felt a thing. The minute you see it, you feel the pain. Well, the opposite can happen in chronic pain, that actually you, you, you over-perceive the pain. And that's where interventions to try and change people's behavior and perception. We're not saying it's all in the mind, but it is largely in the mind. And if you ignore that, you're just being daft. Dr. Mark Porter. You're listening to Airing Pain. And can I just remind you that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, for a person with chronic pain to be told that pain is largely in the mind needs some qualification. For the launch of their special interest group for primary and community care, the British Pain Society invited pain neuroscientist Professor Irene Tracy to address the question. She directs the Brain Imaging Unit at Oxford University. So, all in the mind? It is, because basically pain is generated by the brain. That's the organ that gives you the experience of pain. And a lot of patients get confused about this and get worried about that because they think when the doctor says that, the doctor doesn't believe that the pain is real because they think the mind is something not real. They think it's imagination. They think it's imagination. And in the world of neuroscience, which is the world I work in, and the world of brain imaging, the mind is the brain. And it plays out through brain regions and chemicals in the brain and different what we call physiological processes that basically allow the mind, if you like, to change experiences. And so not only do those tissue damaging signals, say from your bad knee or your bad hip, arrive into the spinal cord and then they go up they can do all that but if the brain doesn't get a hold of them you won't feel pain so it's just as real as having more tissue damage sending more signals into the periphery these things that can go on inside the brain can turn the volume up and they can turn the volume down i mean you seem to have sorted all my problems out i'm in pain yeah you're doing all this marvelous research in oxford mm -hmm. and you have found the region in my brain one spot in my brain that sorts my pain. So we'll mend that spot in my brain and I'm done. Pretty much, but it's not as simple as that. It's not one spot in the brain. And people have for many, many centuries thought that there must be a bit of the brain that is the pain bit, just like the vision bit or the touch bit. And it turns out it's not like that. There isn't one bit because pain isn't like that. Pain is what we call uh, an emergent experience that ultimately you control, if you like, so that you have the appropriate pain for the situation that you're in. Because sometimes you don't want to be distracted by the pain. You know, sometimes if you've had half your leg bitten off by a lion, you really don't want to be lying on the ground worrying about the pain because you're going to be eaten and killed. And that's much worse. So that's a worst outcome. So you've got a fantastic ability in the brain to switch it off. So in certain situations like that, the fight or flight response, you can just switch off those signals. And the brain is the organ that does that. It just stops the signals even arriving inside the brain. So you don't feel any pain. Get away from the line. Of course, when you're away from that high arousal situation, those signals that have coming from the half bitten leg will arrive and then you'll realize that you're in a lot of pain. So it is the case that, you know, there are dedicated areas of the brain that allow you to experience pain, but it's a whole network. It's, it's about 10 different regions. And together, in a very flexible way, these regions will activate more or less, sometimes not, sometimes yes, and they'll vary their activation because, in effect, that's going to control what the type of pain is you're going to experience depending on the situation. And sometimes it will do it such that it won't even allow the signals to come in. So it's a, it's a flexible system. There are certain structures that are very important and seem to always be there and on. So that does give us some idea where we should be targeting in order to get pain relief. Uh, so there is a, a common set of structures that uh, always seems to activate and that's very useful to have as a marker and to have as a, a target, if you like, for therapy. But there are many other structures that can or cannot come in and that will give you the change of quality of the pain. 
How do you know this? Well, we have several different brain imaging tools that can look inside the brain or the spinal cord whilst you're living and sitting here right now, here with me, talking and breathing, because they're non-invasive. And so we've got these tools that can allow us to see where, in effect, oxygen and blood and glucose has been delivered to feed the neurons that are doing the job of whatever it is that you're doing or feeling or experiencing. So for pain, we, in our lab, will take healthy people, we'll burn them, we'll poke them, we'll do all sorts of nasty things to them. They'll have pain experiences and we'll see where this blood flow is going to different parts of the brain and that tells us which are the bits that are important for experiencing pain and then we test that that's real in patients and we show that different parts of it might be more dominant in one type of patient other bits of the brain say giving you the fear side of pain as opposed to the location of where the pain is these are processed say, by different brain regions and what we might show is that in one patient group threats and fear and anxiety might really be a very very key factor for their pain and that is turning the volume up. So it's it's not just changing the way they describe the pain, which you might suspect, you know, if I'm more anxious or more depressed about something, you might just think, well, that's just making you change the way you describe things. What we've shown is that indeed, these changes in your anxiety or depression fundamentally act through brain systems. They switch them on. And if they're switched on, and then that pain signal comes in, it's gonna be processed differently. And what it does is it changes the processing and actually makes it worse, unfortunately. So again, it's, changing the pain just as much as if you're just sending in more tissue injury signals. Knowing what's happening is all very well. How will your research be used to conquer chronic pain? We need to characterise our patients better and understand what is, for that patient, predominantly making them in pain. Is it really a peripheral input? Is it really the bad hip? Or is it actually these amplification mechanisms? You'll never really very easily unravel that just from the person saying, yeah, it really hurts. Is it hurting because it's sending more signal into the periphery? Should I be targeting my therapy to the periphery or should I be targeting it centrally? So by us sort of showing which bits do what and having these sort of markers, we can help dissect and diagnose what is underlying somebody's pain. And that can guide where the therapy should be most appropriately placed. It can also be used for predicting outcome of, say, surgery, joint replacement, the prediction of whether that particular type of drug is going to work for you or not, or work really well or okay. And if it's going to work okay to not at all, this is really valuable. Don't put the patient on the medication if there's a very low probability that's going to work because they have a certain type of mechanism underpinning their pain that's not suitable for that drug. And again, what we can do with the imaging is start to contribute to the better understanding of those mechanisms. Now, I'm not suggesting that all patients then are going to come and be referred for an fMRI exam, a functional imaging exam, because it's, you know, very specialised and quite expensive. But if we can prove the science and understand it and come up with these markers, then our job next phase is to what we call reverse engineer that understanding into simple tests that could be done on the bedside that reflect what's going on with the brain imaging, but could be done by the GP that then in effect sort of classifies, yes, you're the type of patient that would, if I put you in for the fMRI, have that type of signal, you're the type of patient that would do that. And I don't need to do the fMRI because we've already done the science to prove this test I'm doing proves that you've got that, and then you'd be able to guide your therapy better. So that's what we hope to do. That's the translational bit now that's to come. Does this mean that therapies like cognitive behavioural therapies, uh, relaxation therapies, are a waste of time? Oh, not at all. No, I think, again, you know, what the brain imaging has shown is that these therapies you know, which are basically training patients to cope with the pain, use the power, if you like, of their brains to modulate. We've got these incredible inbuilt systems of modulation, which are unique to pain. We don't have them for any other sense. And, and we have them because it's really important to be able to control pain. Going back to that lion biting your leg off, you know, it's these control systems that block the pain. It's really important to be able to control pain. And so what a lot of these therapies are doing is, is training people, if you like, to use the brain and access different parts of their brain, which can help take the hurt away and help them cope with it and think differently about it, you know, change the meaning of the pain. An analogy, you know, we've done some fun experiments, I call them our Friday afternoon experiments, where we've made pain pleasant. Now, there are some people out there who know people who find pain pleasant for many other reasons, but let's just take, you know, people like hot chilli peppers, people who go on marathon runs and extreme exercise where the body is aching, but they like it because it's associated, the meaning of the pain is good. So we know pain and pleasure interact, and it interacts, actually overlaps a lot in the brain. So again, these sounds like fun and, and slightly crazy experiments, but what actually they're telling at a very deep level is that if we can work and understand, you know, how we can flip pain into being pleasurable or changing at least the hedonic value of it, 
you know, that's an outcome. We can take the hurt away. We can change the meaning. And, and we're learning what brain regions can do that. And what we've got to do is work out how to train patients whilst we're still waiting for new drugs that are going to block it in the, in the, in the periphery or in other places. These are incredibly effective therapies, um, which are acting through these wonderful systems that we've got. Some people naturally just tap into them and use them and they're, they're great copers. And they find that they can get a lot of pain relief, you know, without having to go on maybe a course. Others are just not equipped to know how to access them. So they need the formal training as to how to do it. But um, they're very powerful. And as I say, they're tapping in still fundamentally to the very similar overlap of systems that, you know, in effect, the drugs are going to work on. So ideally, you always want to be addressing that angle as well as trying to get the right drug for you. Professor Irene Tracy, Director of the Brain Imaging Unit at Oxford University. You're listening to Airing Pain with me, Paul Evans, and I'm at the launch of the British Pain Society's Special Interest Group for Primary and Community Care. Now, one of the speakers was Anne Taylor of Cardiff University. She specialises in pain education, and her presentation was provocatively titled Nobody Dies from Pain. Or do they? Up till now, a lot of people have said, oh, well, nobody will die of pain. You know, let's not be worried about it. So pain's not necessarily had the focus that it deserves and is not being prioritised as it should. But Blair Smith um, has produced figures now to show that, in fact, you are one and a half times more likely to die if you've got pain than a person who hasn't got pain. And you're twice as likely to die from cardiovascular or respiratory disease if you've got chronic pain. And I think that's because of things like uh, unable to move, so you're unable to exercise, you lose your job, so your diet's poor, um, resort to smoking and alcohol if you're not well managed. So there's, it's a multifactorial reason, so some of those are just reasons off the top of my head. But I think my quest has always been trying to educate health professionals to understand that chronic pain is a condition and it's totally different from acute pain as a symptom. You know, if only chronic pain was that simple that you had a physical pain and nothing else. So it's not a simple entity and I think that punchy message is, is just to get people to kind of have a wake up and think, well, yes, people can die of pain and we need to be prioritising and doing something about it. So what's the answer? Joined up thinking is really, really important. Actually moving away from these kind of helpful silos where you've got the NHS working independently from the Department of Health, Work and the Pension, getting those joined up, getting more involvement of occupational health services, getting uh, more um, services closer to patients' homes so people are assessed and managed early in the pain career so that you know patients don't have to resort to trying to persuade people constantly that they're in pain and actually trying to get something sorted early. So early management, joined up thinking and better education across the board. But all of that's going to be difficult. You're involved with the training medical professionals. Well, I'm involved in the undergraduate pain curriculum, which is chaired by Nick Alcock, looking at a generic curriculum for all people who have been training as healthcare professionals. And there's patient input into that. I'm also involved then running a, a postgraduate master's programme, which is a multi-professional course and it's e-learning, it involves um, all healthcare professionals. I've just launched a 12-week foundation in pain for primary care for GPs to get better educated. Again, it's an e-learning course. In the future, we're going to be developing a diploma in pain management specific for primary community care because that's where I think the majority of pain should be managed. So since the launch of your e-learning website, yes. is there any evidence that GPs and health professionals are really beginning to take up the gauntlet? <laughs> no is the easy answer because we know that we've had 12,000 hits of unique user hits since October, so it's doing very well, so people are accessing the material. But the problem in education is always this theory-practice gap. How much of that education is actually going to influence practice. So yes, we've got some proof that the pain, you know, the education we run is being taken up because, you know, we're inundated with people for the master's programmes and for the standalone module and the website. But how that reflects in practice, we don't know. And that's always a problematic area to research. Anne Taylor of Cardiff University. 
You're listening to Airing Pain, and Professor Richard Langford, President of the British Pain Society, asked his audience at this launch of their special interest group for primary and community care whether the profession should abandon the terms primary and secondary care. I have to say that he did not get much of a response. It was to tease them a little bit uh, with, the, with this concept, but generally speaking, there is a move towards uh, more seamless uh, care. Although there may be geographical differences, uh, there, there'll be different buildings still, there'll be a hospital and there'll be general practices and community clinics and so on, that the concept that people move fairly freely between them and some people who are actually employed in the community will nevertheless have activity in the hospital clinics and vice versa, um, that there is free movement and uh, it is really seen as one system is the way we should go. And so there may be delivery of some very specialised services in the hospital, but essentially the generalised care is the province of everybody. The title of the launch, you put at the top of your title, How to Change Heart Sinks into Favourites. What do you mean by that? Very straightforwardly, that this is uh, not meant remotely in a derogatory way about patients. It's very straightforward that a number of patients have very complex problems. And it's not that there is any dislike also of the patients themselves. Um, it is that the conditions they have are complex. And when practitioners who are often in control of what they're doing find they come up against something which is really difficult or for them they're not adequately trained or experienced enough. And that can always be the case, especially in general practice, where I take my hat off to my colleagues who have to be jacks of all trades and deal with everything that comes in through the door, that clearly it can be frustrating and it can be an anxious matter for the uh, stressful matter for the doctor or nurse dealing with such a complex set of problems. British GPs are probably the best primary care system in the world. I'm very proud of what we've created. You know, we are fantastic at trying to pick up chronic diseases before they develop or to stop them developing further. But we're not doing that with chronic pain, which actually is the biggest part of the problem. So we need to address it in more of a system and just, just think about it within the holistic type of consultation. And hopefully we can give you some tools to help you. At the moment, the GPs will struggle because they probably don't have the tools, but I'm hoping they soon will. An average appointment lasts 10 minutes. Yes. 10 minutes. Is there money for this? No. There's no money actually physically associated for the GPs managing this correctly at the moment. Though this is why we need to get it linked in with quality standards. But there's also other incentives. For example, being very blunt, you know, what we've seen in the States, for example, patients have been um, pursuing their doctor, shall we say, if their pain has not been managed correctly. And, and in fact, if it's overmanaged, you... Um, hopefully we don't have that model within the UK, but I think we need to look at other incentives. So, you know, will there be an incentive for prescribing correctly? Even though I believe, from what I'm told this week, prescribing incentives are probably going to go out the window. Well, actually, one of the incentives for the GPs, who the GPs are going to become the, the purse string holders, and if we actually manage pain correctly, we reduce costs. That, for the GPs, will be a very, very big incentive. What would your message be to GPs? Just think pain, be aware of it and be aware that you can do something about it. Dr Martin Johnson, the Royal College of General Practitioners UK clinical champion for pain management. And that's the end of today's edition of Airing Pain, which is made by Pain Concern, the charity that provides information and support for pain sufferers and those who care for and about us. You can download all the past editions from Pain Concern's website at painconcern, that's one word, painconcern.org.uk. But before I left the launch of the British Pain Society's Special Interest Group for Primary and Community Care, I asked Professor Richard Langford, President of the British Pain Society, what he hoped the outcome of the new group would be and what would leave him smiling at the end of his tenure. If we could see that the special interest group will grow and flourish, uh, it'll uh, increase in membership, that there is ever increasing dialogue between the traditional secondary care specialists, many of whom 
are moving into community delivery of service in the community and primary care as well. But if we have ever-increasing dialogue, a, a stronger relationship with the Royal College of General Practitioners, and actually, in so doing, provide a uh, smoother and better service for the patients, then that would be, I think, uh, something I could look back on as a, a very pleasing outcome.